Praise God. Good to see everyone this morning. We did indeed have a wonderful men's meeting, and I would say more than usual. Uh, I almost wish we could just have recorded what was said and simply played it back. Uh, it would have been just wonderful. Um, and the amazing thing is that I'm sitting there listening to all of this, and over and over and over again, somebody would come out with a scripture is exactly what I had, you know, already thought about in connection with the service this morning. So anyway, some of this is going to sound like repetition to a lot of you, but that's all right. We need it. I certainly do. I certainly feel my need. And uh, I'm not sure where to begin. I'm going to go ahead and just begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. As Paul... I'm going to go, so ahead, go ahead and just pick up a scripture, but then we're going to have to back out and see the context and see how it applies to us, because it certainly applies to me. Uh, you know, as much as at any other time I feel my own need of the Lord helping me to understand an extremely simple principle that I think hinders many of us. And if we understand it, the Lord, we understand what the Lord is doing in our lives, it's a whole lot easier to cooperate with Him and to rejoice in it. And many times we find ourselves without, you know, in our ignorance, just fighting against, the, fighting against God, who is faithful, as we've been singing. He's not going to back off of what He's going to do, but we can enjoy it or we can fight against it and, have, and be miserable. So anyway, Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers here, and uh, well, let me just read verse 18, because I'm going to have to do quite a bit of backing out here. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect or contemplate is, a, is probably more the sense of what it is, and it's, a, it's an alternate reading. We who with unveiled faces all contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. There's a lot in that, and I don't want to try to unpack it all, but I mean, we see God's heart toward us, every one of us, if we're really picking up on what he's, where He's going with this. God's purpose in the beginning is to change us, is to transform us. And what is the nature of that? What is he transforming us into? His likeness. We're not like him. We, and born into Adam's family, we're not like him at all. Not, there's nothing new in this truth that we're, we're talking about. But this is the underlying purpose of what God's doing. We talked about that in the, uh, in the convention. God's underlying purpose in everything is to have a family. And it's not going to be a family of rebels who create a world like we see. It's going to be a family of people who are completely changed so that we're like Him. And every, every atom of our being is like Him. But in the process of getting there, we live in a world that is like we see it. And we come to Him and we're awakened to our need and there is a process of transformation that happens. And uh, it's that process that I believe God wants us to understand in a greater measure. Now, where does this, what's the context of this? Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and one of his, the greatest needs that he sees is a simple one that after he had really brought the people to a genuine faith in Christ, what he had established there had been real. It was not just him doing it, it was the Lord doing it. Then there, then there were other teachers who had a different source of inspiration, who came in there and were trying to subvert what he was doing and turn them aside. <coughs> and so he's writing with that in mind, I want you to get what, my, what the fact that Christ sent me. It wasn't me doing this. And I don't need, in validating my ministry, I don't need to go and get a letter from a recommendation from somebody. You're my recommendation. What God has done in you is the testimony to the fact that God sent me. Okay? And so his confidence to do what he was doing was not in any human ability. It wasn't that he'd been to school and studied and knew how to do it. This was entirely the fact that God had laid his hand upon him and brought him to a place of complete dependence upon God 
And as a fruit of that, God was ministering through him. <coughs> so now the, one of the things he wanted us to understand, wanted them to understand, was the nature of that ministry, and so he compares it to Moses. Now, what was, if you had been listening to Moses this morning, what would he have said? He would have said, here are God's commandments. If you do them, you live. If you don't, you die. I mean, it's a pretty simple thing. Now, God understood in giving the law that we couldn't keep it. But it was meant not to be an end in itself. It was meant to be a means to an end to bring us to a place where we recognized our need and then were able to come to him for the solution. And so in, in picturing the solution that was to come in Christ, he instituted a system of animal sacrifices. And so the death of an animal became a substitute for the death of the sinner. If I were convicted of my sin and I was one that was really wanting to serve God under that system, I would recognize I have sinned. The penalty for my sin is death. I bring this animal to you, Lord, not just as a, a token of a, or a ceremony, but as a representation of my own re uh, giving up of my sin, acknowledging it, desiring forgiveness. But I recognize that forgiveness comes with a price. There is, a, there is a laying down of my life that's necessary, but you have given me a way to do it by the representation of this animal who dies in my place. What a picture that was of what God's ultimate plan was in, in Christ. And so Paul contrasts his ministry with, Paul, with, with Moses, and one of the things he brings out is a simple thing that when Moses came down from the mountain the last time, what, was, what did he look like? His face was glowing, shining. You know, you see these science fiction movies where somebody suddenly gets transported to the next level or whatever it is, and all of a sudden they're shining. Well, he literally was shining. Where did he get that from? See, he had been with God. There was an effect of the presence of God, the, who was spirit, upon him that, that in, was manifested in this way as a testimony to what was going on. That this isn't just Moses making up a bunch of stuff and chiseling out a bunch of stuff on some rocks. God's involved in this. And so God was present in that manifestation. They were having trouble with that, and so he put a veil on. And over time, that gradually subsided. But something happened as they went along. The veil that had covered Moses' face and hidden God's glory in that way suddenly became a different kind of thing, didn't it? The veil wasn't on somebody's face. The veil was in here. It was a matter of the heart. And there were hearts of people who had heard the law and seen the miracles and seen God's mercy and his blessing who nonetheless hardened their hearts and they became unable to hear God's voice, unable to see him. It became a spiritual inability. There was a veil that was covering the heart. And so... Paul likens that to, to what was the, the condition of the Israel of Israel in his day. The Jews, for the most part, were blind. And the blindness was, was, again, because of what was going on in the heart. But there is a condition under which that veil is removed. What is that condition? When the heart turns to the Lord. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for religious performance. He is looking to, for a heart that will open up and say, God, I need you. You know, there are a lot, of, a lot of times we would love to see earthly circumstances go better. We would like to see peace and happiness and prosperity. You know, how many times do you know that God has used very difficult circumstances, tragedies, all war, uh, you name it, he has used those things to try to speak to people. How many of you know that the church has been pure under difficult persecution that it has here in America? It's a better condition. Why? Because people see and they feel their need and they cry out to God. We trust in everything in the world except him more than we dare realize but here is, here's Paul's ministry. He's recognizing another aspect of this is a very simple one. When Moses gave them laws, they were just rules. It's, 
here are my requirements. It's up to you to measure up. And, of course, he knew they couldn't. So God was using that to, to get them to move them toward the, uh, the hope of the gospel later on. But when Paul ministered, and he did it not with human intellect, not with human abilities, he says in another place, in 1 Corinthians, he came and he ministered by God's power. So what is it that's actually ministered? You say God's Word, yeah. But, I mean, is it, when we think of God's Word, a lot of people, you go into a lot of churches today, and their concept of this is we have to get our doctrines accurate. As long as we are absolutely true to the words on this page and the doctrines of the church, we'll proclaim that, we will study it, we will, you know, we will we'll convey that with our human ability. There's not this concept that I have got to have God's literal presence enabling me to minister something besides words. Words themselves have no power except they may, they may educate your intellect. I, it's scary how many Christians suppose, in, in name will actually come to the end of the way and realize they have been educated religiously but they have never met the one they're talking about. But God has a way of coming and ministering himself, and it's through the words that he speaks. Jesus said, the words that I speak are spirit. It's not just the ideas that need to be conveyed. If a human heart is going to be changed, if we're going to literally be changed, it's going to take more than words and concepts and ideas and all that. It's going to take God's Spirit entering into the, to our innermost being. That's what the heart represents here. This is the core of our being. This is what drives us. This is the engine by which we live. And so, uh, so Paul is, is, on the one hand, he's talking about what his ministry consists of. It's the Word. I mean, it's, it's the, not just the letter of the Word, not just the words. It's the Spirit that is conveyed through that that actually goes in and it imparts the, the life of God to those that are open and able to hear it, okay? So then, of course, is when he comes to this point about how, how the veil is taken away. How is it that people can actually come to a place where they can hear? There has to come a point when God initiates something in the human heart. But it isn't just that he comes in and takes over and says, you're mine whether you want to be or not. There is a, a dealing with the heart where the heart has to open and say, I need something that I don't have. I need someone that I don't know. And I'll tell you, that, that sets everything in motion. Folks, there are, there are so many people. That this is the need. You know, we've talked, seemed like over and over again, I have this same sense when I'm, I, I'm trying to minister that I, I'm talking to people who don't know the Lord, but I'm talking to people who do, and I want to cover both bases in a sense. Folks, if you're not there, if Christ has not come in as resident Lord, this is the place you need. You need to recognize that this is more than a religious ceremony or ritual we're going through here this morning. I believe with all my heart there's a core of people here who understand what the process really is. We need the living presence of Christ. We need His words spoken to your heart that have power to go in here and make a change. Bring conviction of your own need, conviction of who Jesus is, and the need to bow, the, bow your heart to him and put your entire trust in, his, in him for time and eternity. There's a transaction that takes place. But, so that's, that is part of it. But now he's, he's not writing here to people who don't know the Lord, is he? He is writing to people who know the Lord, and now they're coming, and they're listening, and they're understanding his message. And, and what a contrast this is from other people who just come in and give their doctrines and their ideas, and, and there's another spirit behind it. But here it is. In the, heart, in the middle of this, you have people whose hearts are open. They're listening. There's an openness to look. This is not, so, I'm, I'm going to think about this. I'm, I'm, I'm not really ready to receive it, but I'm going to consider it. This is somebody who says, oh, God, this is, this is what I need. Your words, the entrance of your words give light. The Scripture is full of the, 
of what happens when God gets into the human heart. And so now you've got somebody who says, oh, God, I'm here. I'm thirsty. I need you. I'm not just here to go through a form. I'm here because I need your words to show me, to shine light in a dark place in here. This has got to be not just theological education, but life. How do I live for you? How can I be more like you? Because we're not. So how does that happen? It happens when every one of us just come and say, oh, God, here's my heart. Let there be no barrier. I'm ready to hear. And you know, there's, there's, a, there's a sense of contemplation. It's, you know, we, we think about how change happens, but here, here's Paul's prescription for that. I'm looking at him. I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at around me. I'm not looking at me, especially. But I'm looking at him, and somehow in just looking from my heart, not just my intellect, I'm looking from my heart, something happens. Something, I begin to be, how many of you know you are, you become what you look at, become like what you look at? See, this has to do with seeing from the heart, or seeing with the heart, I guess would be as good a title as, as anybody could come up with maybe for this one. Seeing with the heart, that's what it has to become. Where we see, we learn to see everything from our hearts in harmony with what God is like and his purpose. Every bit of this is, is all about that. Lord, I want to be like you. I have no power to be like you. But I want to listen. And, and you know, this isn't just in here. It is here. If the Lord's, if the Lord's anointing something, it's here. There's an opportunity where Christ wants to put, plant something in your life that's going to change you and me forever. But you know, this becomes something personal too. This becomes a relationship where we walk with the Lord, where our eyes and our hearts are turned to Him more and more and more with a sense, Lord, I want to worship, I just I want to spend some time and worship you. I want to praise you. I want to be thankful. Not just, oh, thanks for that. But I mean a genuine, from the heart. Sometimes we can do stuff on the outside that we know we're supposed to do, but it doesn't really come from here. How much good do you think that does? The Lord wants us to have this relationship where we can, our, our focus gets to be on Him and His person and what He's like. And I believe that there is a faithfulness to God. We talk about, sing about His faithfulness this morning that will make Himself known and the times and the ways he makes himself known will be in the circumstances of life. Do you see the connection here? When I'm experiencing something that he has allowed in my life, how do I see it? Do I really see him? How do I feel about it? How do I, do I understand it? How do I approach it? Some people will understand, will, will try to approach the things of God with their intellect. And that seems to be the governing force in their life. Other people, boy, they want to see something. You know, didn't Paul talk about that? The Jews, Jews are, uh, well, the, the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. When I experience something in life, I've got to understand it with this brain of mine. I've got to figure this out. You know, there's times and God puts us in places where we don't, we, had, we don't have the answers. And the answer to the, to the situation is not to have the intellectual answer. The answer is to trust our Heavenly Father. And every one of us should be able to look back at our infancy, of our when we were young, we were young enough so that we had to trust our parents with things that we, they didn't bother to explain to us. But it was okay because we knew they loved us, and they knew how, they knew how to get to, from point A to point B. If we were going to visit Grandma, I didn't have to get the map out and say, oh, my God, how are we going to get there? I just got in the car, and we'd sit in the back seat and fuss and carry on. You know, that was my job to... Mess, you know, mess around with my sisters and tease them and get teased in, in turn. My parents' job was to get us there. But we're like infants, folks. 
We feel like we've got to understand everything. We've got to see it in order to believe it. God is, God is changing us. He is delivering us from that kind of a, that kind of a life where we've got to see everything in, in some other way other than just with the heart. And I'll tell you, if there's an openness to him, we're going to see more than just ideas and, and explanations. We're going to see the heart of somebody who loves us to the point he sent his son to die a horrible death so that you and I could be free and could be forgiven. Oh, praise God. That's what it's got to come down to. It's a heart of just seeing him in such a fashion that, oh, God, that's all I need. Lord, the fact that you love me, the fact that you've demonstrated your love for me, Lord, I want to be like that. I want to be like you. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to contemplate you. I'm going to be aware of you in this circumstance. I'm going to see it through your eyes. You know, you, I guess you could go on and on, but I, I don't want to over, over belabor some of this, but I, I don't know. I just, Lord, help me to bring in what needs to be brought in. But this business of seeing with the heart, there's more to it than we realize. You know, the Paul makes reference. We've uh, referred to this verse in Ephesians one. Just hang on to your, to your, to the other passage. But Paul is praying here for the Ephesian believers. And he says in verse 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Isn't knowing him better the essence of what this is all about? It's not knowing about him, it's knowing him. That's what Paul said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and all of that. I pray that the eyes of your heart, isn't that interesting? The eyes of your heart may be enlightened. What's the result of that? In order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and so forth. And he goes on to talk about the power that is at work for us. But isn't that an interesting expression, the eyes of the heart? Do you know your heart has eyes? We are so in tune with this world, much more than we dare to realize. Oh, God, we need to have these eyes opened and active and in control, and our lives would be very, very different. Look back at uh, how Paul is unfolding his own experience, but there's stuff built into, baked into what he's talking about here that are, that are very pertinent to what we're talking about. So he's talking about his ministry and how he, how he sets the truth forth plainly. Then he talks about the condition of men in verse 3. And if our gospel, our good news, is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now, why is that? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. This is an inability that only God's in intervention can change. And when he intervenes, this is when the heart needs to say, yes, Lord, open my, open my heart, open my eyes. Help me to see through your eyes what life is all about. You know, I shared with the men uh, uh, briefly a statistic that I had read the other day Boy, it shows the condition of this world that has pushed God out of the picture. We're going to do it our way. It was something like 89% of the millennial generation in England answered a survey that they see, they see no purpose in their life. They just feel lost and aimless. What's my life? Why am I, who am I? What am I here? My God, do you see the power of darkness that has gripped this world? I want to be free from that. I want to see past it. I don't want it to influence me. Look what it took for God to do something for this man who was ministering. For God, verse 6, 
The same God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Man, if you don't have that, you don't have anything. Your life is meaningless, short, temporary. The entire purpose is to come to know him and to be transformed and made into his image. Only he can do that. But oh, he needs a heart. So now he's demonstrating another principle, but we have this treasure. Boy, what a treasure it is, too. You want silver, gold? You can have it. This is the treasure we need. Folks, if you have Christ in your heart, you are among the richest people on this planet. What they have will perish. What we have can never perish. Praise God. Boy, if we, if we could learn to see life and, and our life in this world the way God wants us to, the way God sees it. We have this treasure in jars of clay, these bodies of ours. Why? To show. What's the purpose of that? It shows that this all-surpassing is power is from God and not from us. Whew. I'm glad it's not from us because I ain't got none. Not when it comes to the needs that he's talking about here. There's no way I can fix me or, or make myself like. But, oh, he's, he's going he's gonna to do it, isn't he? So how does he go about doing that? Okay. Here's the part we do not like naturally. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Man, there's some glorious butts in that one. Now, how is it that a human being could experience all of these things and yet always come to this positive conclusion in every bit of it? How does that happen? You think that has a, there's a connection between what, what we're talking about here? That his heart is open and he's seeing past the circumstances? Do you see where this, I mean, is that a theme this morning in the men's, men's meeting? Over and over again, you see somebody that has the power to say, yes, I'm experiencing a terrible thing, but my life, my my." my well-being, let's put it that way, is not dictated by the circumstance in which I find myself. This is not what governs my thinking, my life, my reactions. I dare say more than we would like to admit, these things do govern how we act and react and think. You know, there's a scripture that Brother Thomas used to use, and many of you will remember him preaching on it, and it was mentioned this morning. I, I, time and time again, I had to smile. Lord, there it is again. There's somebody, one of the scriptures I just thought about, and there, somebody brings it out, somebody brings out another one. But it was uh, Jesus talking about uh, the sermon, the so-called Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, what's the blessing? They shall see God. And the point was rightly made because God is invisible. We're not talking about seeing an image. We're not talking about the earthly seeing. There's a different kind of seeing. This is a seeing that comes from here. This is an ability to discern God at work in this sin-cursed world, doing, fulfilling his purpose and bringing us into harmony with his purpose while the world around us is just blindly plunging towards destruction. I thank God that he's going to reach his. But that's the reality of it. Oh, I'll tell you, there is a treasure beyond treasures if we have the ability to see him. What is it that brings a human heart into that place? How, does he, how do you get a pure heart? You're going to have to bring it and lay at his feet. He's promised us a new heart and a new spirit, hasn't he? And how does that come about? Because I've earned it in some fashion? No. I've just laid down everything at his feet and said, I trust in you. You have got to save me. You have got to do for me the, that which I could never possibly do. And he cleans my heart 
It's so clean. It's as if I've never done anything. He gives me, you go over to, uh, just jump ahead, a, a chapter in, in chapter 5 there. When Christ becomes my righteousness, I, he gives me the same righteousness that his son has. Is his son righteous? Yeah. You talk about purity. This is amazing. And when God looks at me, he sees me just as pure as he is. Only God can do something like that. Only God can do something like that. And there's a, there is a fountain for my need as I go along because there's no such thing as perfection in this world. There is victory, but there's not perfection. And so when I, when I come to that place where I realize I have a need, I've, I've, I've fallen short, I've got some place I can go. I don't have to wallow. I don't have to sit there and beat myself up. How did you do that? I know how I did it because it was me doing it. This is not complicated stuff. If I act out of my own resources, it ain't going to be good. But the Lord is working in me so that I will learn to lean upon him and all that he is. Everything that I have a need for in that time comes. You know, the Scripture was, was referred to. It's also in 2 Corinthians. I think it's in chapter 10 where Paul was put in a very difficult place, and God did it. God is looking down at Paul and seeing a heart that says, I want to serve you. Oh, God, I want to go for it. You've done so much for me. And the Lord's looking at Paul and saying, yeah, but you're kind of proud about this. You don't understand that, but I see it. There's a bit of, man, look at me, God, what God's done for me. I've seen visions. I've been up in heaven. I've been all kinds of places. And the Lord said, well, if I'm going to answer your prayer about effective ministry, we got work to do here. So his, the work, what he did was to, I, I don't know if he literally summoned the demon, but whatever it was, he was aware of Satan's design to try to bring down Paul. So he said, all right, angel, the one guarding you, guarding Paul, my plan involves letting that demon come in and give him a hard time. You know, I was thinking about this over a little bit ago uh, before we got up here. The, the, the reality of what of God's mercy and faithfulness in this world. This world is ruled over, the world system is ruled over by the devil who hates God. He hates you. How long do you think if God took his hand completely off how long do you think it would take the devil to kill every single one of us? Do you not realize the incredible mercy of God who sets his angel beside every one of his, watches over us, and we're not even paying attention, don't even realize it, how good God is to his people and how much we need him? the angel of the Lord, and camps round about them that fear him and delivers them. So here's the Lord. You know that devil wanted to get at Paul a long time, and the Lord said, no, it's not time. Angel, you just take care of, take care of business here. It's going to be okay. But then there come a time when that was the need. And so the Lord let that devil buffet him, and of course Paul did what every one of us would have done. Oh, God. Get this bad devil off of me. I'm trying to serve you. What did I do to deserve this? A thousand and one thoughts that we all wrestle with. And nothing happened. I better, I better pray harder. Let me fast. You know, it says he prayed three times. This was, this was three seasons of prayer. This was not just three little prayers. This was some serious seeking of God. And finally, the Lord looked down and saw that he had gotten to a place where the Lord could talk to him. And then he understood it was because of all of this stuff and the danger of pride and how that would have hindered him that the Lord allowed this. But you know, doesn't the Scripture say that when, 
when we're seized by temptation or by testing, it comes with something else, doesn't it? There's always a way of escape. And what does the way of escape involve? Is it from the situation or is it through it that we may be able to bear it? And so the Lord said to Paul, my grace is enough. My grace is enough. I have got divine strength that's going to make you able to withstand this and keep doing what you're doing, and it's going to be effective. But in the process, I'm doing something about that pride so it won't get in the way. And so Paul said, wow, this is awesome. This is amazing. Thank God I'm, I'm, I'm weak. Oh, praise God, isn't that awesome? Because I want to serve him and I want to be effective, and the only way I can do it is to be weak. Then praise God he's made me weak. That's a different perspective. It takes a different way of looking at stuff to be able to say stuff like that. Now, he didn't do that because he looked at the situation and because of his feelings or any earthly consideration. The eyes of his heart kind of got open, didn't they? That's amazing when you stop, stop and think about how merciful God is to balance everything so perfectly. And so that was... That's what Paul, that's why Paul could talk about these circumstances. To be hard pressed is not the way we would choose to go. Isn't, there, isn't it wonderful that the, the Word of God does not give us this unrealistic picture of life? Jesus never promised a trouble free life. Come to Jesus and then sail through. Come to Jesus and it's going to be war. But you're going to have Jesus with you in the war. And we know how it comes out because he's already won the victory. Praise God. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. No matter what the devil tried to do, he could not accomplish anything except what God allowed him to do. And Paul had the eyes of the heart open, and he was able to see. And the same thing. And he didn't demand like we do. Oh, how we react to stuff. Now it's quiet. How we react to things that are adverse, that we don't like. We're going to blame somebody for sure if there's somebody involved. And sometimes if we're honest enough, we're going to be blaming God. We're going to carry a spirit of resentment on the inside. We might say the right stuff, but down in here there's a resentment about why is my lot this way and theirs isn't. Somebody, like somebody else, they're doing good. Of course, you don't know what, what's really happening in their lives. But, oh, do we react according to human understanding, human emotions. We want to explain it. I mean, look at look this other one that he said. Uh, perplexed. Now, what does being perplexed mean? You don't know. It doesn't seem to be any rational explanation for what's going on. I just don't understand. And the Lord wasn't sitting there saying, well, I'm going to explain it to you. The Lord just let him sit there and deal with it. Perplexed, but not in despair. How could he do that? How could he overcome the natural emotions that come from that, except that he saw things? Through it and passed it to a God who loved him, who had a purpose to change him into His image, and He knew where it was late, where it was headed. It was headed for glory. That's what I'm. That's what is governing my heart and my life. I see that God opened my heart to something that is beyond this world. That's what I'm living for. If this is what it takes to get there, then then Lord help me, because I know, I know You're going to help me through it. What a vision that he was able to share in this thing. Not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry about in our, around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. I mean, you can't deal with this, this reality of living in this world and really serving God until you get this, not effectively. 
And I, I don't want to say it's like jumping from here to here, but it's got, this, is, this is where it's at. You can have this superficial, I, I'm happy, 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 thank you for giving me a ticket to heaven, Jesus, but this is what it's about, making us like him. Well, if I'm going to, something's got to happen. You know, I think Ben said it in, the mor- uh, in some fashion in the, me- in the meeting this morning, that if I'm not like him, then there's stuff in here that's got to go. And God's going to institute whatever it takes for this to go, but he's going to replace it with something that's so much better, the peace and the joy that comes with it. This is not just death and misery. This is life. This is freedom. Praise God. So the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. That's kind of like Jesus. He gave up everything so that he could share God's life with you and me. That's why we're here this morning. Without that sacrifice of his earthly life, we wouldn't have any hope at all. But it's that to which he has called every single one of us to give up our lives to him so that he can, he can express his life in us. He can make us like him. And being like him, we're going to care about each other. We're going to pray for each other. We're going to be there for each other. There's going to be a literal flow of the life of God. If you could see it, it would be like water, like living water that would literally flow from one to another. And you'd see somebody that was dry, and you'd see somebody else, the Lord send somebody else, and water would flow to a thirsty soul. I'll tell you, if we could understand the, the ways of God, our lives would be so different. We go around in a, a funk half the time when we ought to be shouting. Well, I need to be looking at the mirror when I'm preaching this one. We are so prone to being, well, just every kind of self-centered thought. You can, I can't even think of the words, but I know what it feels like, and so do you. When we're sort of self-pitying, depressed. What are we looking at? What are we using? What eyes are we looking at when we're that way about anything? It's not these eyes. We're looking at it from a purely human, self-centered point of view. God, you're not treating me right. God, why did this happen? Why do I, why did they do that? You know, and it's all about them and, and how bad they are. Oh, God, there's so many ways that we think and look about life that get in the way of being in the position that Paul is describing right here. But I want to have an open face, don't you? Isn't that where this started? We all with an open face is what the King James says, I think. There's a contemplation of glory that God is revealing. God's revealing something that most people don't see. But there is a part of our being that's able to see the glory of God. It's not, that we're not some physical thing we can see, but it's, it's a reality. There is life beyond this world. Jesus Christ is real. His promises are true and they're real. And they have become an anchor for my soul. The hope of all of that has become so real that it's my anchor. God wants us to live in the reality of that and not let life get to us and rule us. And that be the thing that we see. You know, one of the things that gets in our way the most is not just the stuff out here, but it's the stuff in here. Oh, how could God care about somebody like me? Look at me. Look at all that's wrong. Look how long I've known him and I'm still struggling with in this area or in that area. Oh, God, I can see where you could bless other people, but me, no. Every one of us struggles. But all we need to do is to look at our Savior and see the people to whom he reached out. Like the day he was walking through Samaria, waiting at a well. 
and a woman came out. Now you talk about the most unlikely person, one of the most unlikely people that somebody who, the Son of God, do you know who he is? This is the Son of God, all right. How, how he could have anything to do with her. I mean, look at the religious leaders. They were so scrupulous to keep the law and to consider themselves righteous and look down at everybody else. And here's the very Son of God who is righteous, and he walks right up to her and begins to talk to her. She's not just a Samaritan the Jews despised. Her own village hated her. Because she'd been through half of the men. And now she was living with somebody that wasn't her husband. And Jesus didn't soft pedal her what she had done, what she was guilty of. But instead of rejection, instead of condemnation, she felt love and hope from this man. And, and it just, you know, do you see his heart? Do you think his heart toward you is different than it was towards her? I mean, just, just meditate on the people in the Scriptures to whom he reached out. So many times when we're beaten down by our own failures, is it not pride? Isn't pride involved? How could I do that? How could I be that way? When are we going to learn that it's salvation? and not self-effort, and just come and say, Lord, I bring all of my brokenness to you, but I'm looking not at the brokenness. I'm looking at the cross. I'm looking at your word. I'm looking at your heart. I'm looking at your promises, and I just cast myself upon you. Everything that I see about it, I can't fix it, but you can Help me to see you in every circumstance and never turn to the flesh, never turn to, never allow these other things to take root in my being, the bitterness, discouragement, anger, resentment. All these other things come from a different set of eyes. They don't come from the Lord, do they? But oh, I'll tell you what. You see where Paul's coming from in this? and how he was able to do what he did. How many of us need to be learn how to turn to the Lord in life when life happens and lift up our eyes and say, God, I know you're good. This circumstance does not alter your faithfulness. It does not alter your love for me. It doesn't alter anything. It doesn't alter your promises. But Lord, I cast myself upon you for the strength to be like you, to learn how? By going through this to become like you. Because didn't Jesus kind of go through a few things? Yeah, more than we, you and I will ever will. That same Jesus takes up residence in the human heart that will open and begins to change us. But these are his tools. Life is his toolbox. And he's going to do stuff. He's going to bring us through all kinds of circumstances. I thank God when he takes us into a nice, comfortable, wonderful place where we can just enjoy him and step back from the battle. But use that to get ready. Don't, don't ever find yourself in a place where you say, okay, this is what it's about. Oh, thank God I've finally gotten to Beulah Land. Now I can coast. No, you're, you're in Beulah Land to kind of rest up and get ready for the next battle. And the Lord's going to go with you in it. He knows exactly how to bring every one of his children home, and he's promised to do it. But, oh, doesn't he want, doesn't he want my eyes open, more open than they are? These eyes. So that in every circumstance I can see him. It is written, we're back in first, second, second Corinthians 4, isn't it? It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Bec why? Because we know 
that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. That's a pretty good way to see life. If we can learn to see life in terms of the goal, it will make the process a whole lot easier. That's what he's talking about. All this is for your benefits. Why? So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. How many times have we looked at this scripture? But see it in the, in the context of, of a heart that is looking to God. When the word is coming forth, it's open and say, God, speak to me. I don't know. And I don't just need concepts here. I need a measure of your spirit. I need, I need an infusion of, of actual life and power. When I go to you in prayer, Lord, I don't come to complain about my life. I need to come and say, oh, God, open my eyes to see your heart in this circumstance, to become more like you, to take this not as a, not as a, a being beaten down as a place of loss, but as a place to a victory, a place of opportunity to grow. Isn't that how Paul looked at it? Therefore, we do not lose heart. And this was quoted this morning. Though outwardly, we are wasting away. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. I think it was quoted by Johnny. We, we listened to a short video, uh, video, the audio of a video, uh, from Johnny Erickson. And... Johnny Erickson Tata, and most of you, know, I think, know who she is. And the uh, occasion for the short video was her 52nd anniversary of her accident that has left her paralyzed in a wheelchair. And she wasn't sitting there, oh, poor me. This was a praise God, look what God has done in my heart. I'm, I, I am more looking forward to the Lord and enjoying Him and rejoicing in Him than I ever was before because, yes, this body is wasting away, but it will anyway. I can't keep this. But He's doing something in here that's eternal. And that's just got, my, got all my attention. Like I said afterward, you look at Johnny, and nothing, we got nothing to complain about. God raised her up to be a mighty example of His mercy and His grace, and she has had a voice that, has, that nobody can argue with. It's gone around the world. She can go into China. What can they say? And she has. What can they say? Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Are you? Do you see the connection between the eyes of faith being exercised and an openness of heart having an open heart toward God and saying yes and having a thankful heart and, and literally being changed? Are we fighting it or are we understanding it and going and cooperating with the Lord? That's what it's about. All right? Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light. Now the perspective comes. For our light and momentary troubles. It's hard for us to think of them that way when we're in the middle of them particularly if they go on any amount of earthly time, momentary, you got, you're kidding me. But when we look back one day, we're going to say, boy, that was just, that was nothing. In the light of where I'm at now, why, why did I make such a fuss about this or that or that person or this circumstance? Why in the world did, did I look at it that way? For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us. They're not just stuff we got to go through for no reason, is what he's saying. They're actually the tools that are achieving something. Do you, understand? Do you get that? This is not just incidental to the process. This is, these are God's means of changing us into his image. Our reaction to that, our faith, our looking to him, our dependence upon the promises of God in the face of stuff is what is changing us. Boy, when we fight it and fuss and do everything else, we're just prolonging the process and spinning our wheels and getting nowhere. But the Lord is faithful, isn't he? He's patient. Thank God. 
they are achieving for us what? An eternal glory. Oh, my. We, we have no idea. We have no idea what's coming. That a, an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So here again, you see Paul talking about his eyes. But what eyes is he talking about? He's not talking about these. We're going to keep seeing stuff that we don't want to see as long as we're in this world. But there are, eye, there are other eyes that God has given us. If he's come in, there, we have eyes. We don't need to shut them and, and, be, and be mad. We need to have eyes that are open. And so, but, pa, but Paul is saying there's a real contest going on here. It doesn't automatically, we don't automatically see just because Christ is in here. There's some cooperation. There's some understanding that has to happen here so that I can choose in those circumstances to react his way and not my way. So we fix our eyes. There's a deliberate, conscious choice. We fix our eyes on what? Not on what is seen. That's a strange thing. Fix our eyes on not what is seen? Obviously, he's not talking about these, is he? Talking about something here. It's not, we fix our, these eyes not on what these eyes see. That's what he's talking about. Not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. Aren't you glad? I don't care what your circumstances are in this world. How distressing they may, they may be. It's temporary. It will not last. What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I praise God. I, I thought of other things. I don't think I'm going to take the time. I'll, I'll make this brief comment. One other thing I thought about is actually a, a scripture from Proverbs that doesn't sound like it fits, but I believe it does. A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. There is a connection with what we're talking about this morning and your health. I don't want to say every, every ill health is this, but you understand what I'm saying. If we refuse to open our eyes and cooperate with what the Lord's doing, we can be ministering ill health. If you let yourself get angry and, and resentful and depressed and all those kind of things, it's going to take you down. It's going to manifest itself in your body. But what about if we can look past that and rejoice in the Lord and be thankful to Him? Isn't that going to be ministering health to us? That's the best vitamin there is. Praise God. May God give us. I'll tell you, if you know Him, you've got eyes in here. But the question is, are they open? Are we looking to him with an openness of heart and a surrendered heart and a, a heart that trusts him in every kind of circumstance and saying, God, you love me. Your promises are true. I am trusting in you right now, and I know and I thank you for the strength to become more like you through this circumstance that I happen to be in. And I tell you, God's going to be doing something. We're going to look back and say, wow. How you could take somebody like me and make me like that. That's incredible. Praise God. And I'll tell you, we're going to gather around the throne and we're going to just be overwhelmed with the goodness and the love of God. We see it in a glass darkly, <laughs> but then face to face. I'll tell you, isn't God... Isn't God amazing and faithful? May the, eye, may the eyes of our heart, may we, may we learn to see with the heart, I guess is the, is the essence of this. And I'll tell you, life is going to be a whole lot easier, a whole lot better. Praise God.